welcome to Think Tech Hawaii on this Monday. Uh, this show is the state of the state of Hawaii. And uh, we're on every Monday and I'm your host, Stephanie Dalton. Every two weeks, this show covers state news, events and issues affecting Hawaii, like business, governing, economics, law, executive emergency orders, education, among many other topics. Today's show takes a look at education and uh, in the state and an approach to teaching that came from a local speech practice here uh, and became a powerful strategy enlivening teacher teaching where, wherever it's used. Our guest is um, Dr. Ronald Gallimore, Emeritus uh, UCLA and formerly a UH uh, Manoa professor who studied Hawaiian families on the leeward coast of Oahu in the late 60s. The study uh, found uh, Hawaiian youngsters had home experience and potential to be much more successful in the school. For the program developed from the study was therefore devoted to improving school uh, student school performance. Many approaches were used, eventually including allowing students to use uh, what we call talk story, their own language in lessons. In Hawaii, casual conversation is frequently in the form of talk story and Hawaii's local talk or talk story actually dates from before Hawaii statehood, often considered more as a dialect uh, um, or pidgin or a Hawaiian Creole. Our guest, Dr. Gallimore, worked with Hawaii's teachers to develop talk story into a useful teaching technique with the effects of improving school performance. And uh, it was labeled um, the instructional conversation. So welcome back, Dr. Gallimore. Juan, thank you for coming back to talk story about teaching <laughs> instructional conversation. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And um, with this, Dr. Gallimore is pretty formal. Couldn't, couldn't you remember that my you've called me Ron for <laughs> two decades? So. Certainly. Uh, just, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know you continue to professionally develop co your colleagues and teachers uh, in, in the use of instructional conversation um, and, of course, our endless talks about it. But when you uh, originally went out to the Leeward Coast, did uh, you, you must have encountered it there. Were you using, did you encounter it there and notice it? And then did you have to use it to work in the community you studied? just as a matter of a little background? Well, uh, I spent two years living on the Waianae Coast and uh, much of that time I spent on the Nanakuli homestead with families or, or in the schools, uh, uh, working with teachers and making observations. But while I noticed there was a characteristic way people conversed, uh, I have to tell you, I was pretty naive when it came to that kind of conversational analysis. And it was Steve Boggs um, and some of the students that he worked with that actually did the original work on the talk story. And he, Steve actually eventually published the book. And then there were many people at the Kamehameha Lab School where we all worked together for many years, Kathy Al among others, Violet Mays, who uh, left the project pretty early, um, Richard Day, who was a linguist from the University of Hawaii. So it, the credit for identifying talk story and giving it, giving it its academic foundation research-wise really belongs to others. I just benefited from being around some very smart and perceptive people. And uh, so yes, I, uh, we did notice it. I did see it, but I didn't really know what to call it until later. Mm -hmm. But eventually it played a big role in the work we did, all we did together. Well, I think that um, you had to, um, with, the, with the communication work that you did, and uh, you certainly uh, were able to manage it so that it, it's not like encountering a foreign language. It is, it is um, um, understandable 
Um, and it, it is possible to, to move into conversation with that. And even though not being proficient with that, you can still enjoy it. Would you, would you agree with me on? Absolutely. On... I mean, the local dialect is a communication tool and it works very well. I mean, anybody who wants to demean uh, pigeon, creole, whatever uh, it's referred to, it's a mistake. It is an effective communication tool, and it, but it is a separate, it's a separate from standard English. Yeah. And it's important to realize that you can be, you can speak both very well. In fact, some of the most able people in Hawaii then, and I'm sure now, can switch codes. They can switch from standard English back to the local dialect. And uh, in fact, I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona, and believe it or not, there's a local dialect in Tucson, Arizona. And when I go back there, I find myself lapsing back into pronouncing words in a certain way that I grew up with. So it's just that pidgin and uh, uh, a dialect in Hawaii, Hawaii English sometimes it's called. Um, well, yeah, and I mean, I bring it up because um, it, I, it, is a, it is accessible with, without a lot of proficiency. It's much more enjoyable if you, have, you are proficient in it, but for, for teachers to be expected to uh, hear that and understand it and work with it is not an insurmountable task. So I just, I just kind of wanted to get it at that level of understanding what it is and, and, and doesn't require language learning. There are other things about it that it requires. But Although, it, honestly, when I first got to the Waianae Coast at Nanakuli, right straight off the airplane from California. It did take me a while to develop the ear. And, but you're right, it didn't, I, I knew what people were trying to tell me, but I didn't pick up all the little nuances and the subtleties, it took a little while. You have to use it to, to get good with it and, uh, and enjoy it because it's a lot of fun, uh, which is another real positive <laughs> aspect of it because it, it can really enlive in the conversation as, as we said here. But you know, I did find um, that I was teaching in high school at about that time here in Hawaii. And I just realized that the state education frameworks where they have the policies of the department about how and what you teach, they actually were about promoting the use of standard uh, English in the classroom. So um, I, I don't think that was unusual. I, I, I think the state was not unusual in, in promoting uh, standard English use in the classroom. And perhaps they still do, but it's just that it, it, is a written po it was a written policy um, and they encouraged the use of standard of standard. Um, right, right. Well, yeah. I found when I was living out in the uh, Leeward Coast, this is in the 60s, many of the Native Hawaiian families living on the, on the homestead mm -hmm. wanted their students or their children to learn standard English. Yeah. They just didn't, <laughs> but they didn't want them to stop being able to communicate when they went home in a more familiar <laughs> dialect. And that it's the same thing we find on the mainland. Many uh, immigrants from Latin America, Mexico, whose children come to school speaking Spanish, uh, we found in our longitudinal studies in Southern California that the family celebrated the fact that their students came home with good grades in standard American English. They wanted them to be fluent in English, but they didn't want them to lose their Spanish. Right. They English is one thing, and it's that this this kind of thing is it's not. Um, it is at the dialect level as it approaches being a language. But I wanted to know what did teaching? Um, what did you first? What was your first impression of this idea of teaching with talk story and actually, you know, bringing that into the classroom with um, students such as um, the the needy students that we have here who might have only had that one code only had the, the Hawaiian pigeon code with the talk story in it. And right. if you're into school, then you're thinking like the state, let's get them on to standard English. But well, so what were you thinking as a person working um, in the school where the program was trying like crazy to get these kids to meet their potential, show their potential in the schoolwork? Before we started the Kamehameha Lab School in 1971, what I saw in the public schools was a 
struggle. Um, you know, the teachers were, you know, very conscientiously trying to encourage the, teach, uh, the kid, uh, students to uh, talk in standard English, but the students didn't have much background out in Nana Ikapono school at the time. So it was, uh, it was like a struggle, right? And so I noticed that a lot of time was spent in criticism and correcting. So the instructional time got taken up with some um, distracting and digressive you know, talk about how to correctly say words. So the new learning kind of got put in the background. And that turned out to be one of the important observations that Steve and his graduate students, and eventually when we opened the lab school, uh, the, the staff there, I don't want to take any credit for, the, for this because they're the ones, uh, Kathy Ao, Kathy Jordan, Sherilyn Chun at the time her name was, um, and many others were the contributors to this because they were trying things out in the classroom. And I think a little later today, we're going to show a bit of video. We're going to talk about that uh, whenever that comes up. But, but I just want to make sure that we didn't instantly know what to do. We, it took time to learn and learn and make mistakes and keep trying things. It took quite a while. Well, I think that that's what the video uh, will help us understand uh, what what this means. I mean, we're going to take a look at a video with a very uh, um, good teacher, good in the sense of practice with this technique and with youngsters that are actually kindergartners, but they are speaking pigeon. And what I wanted to do was get ready to show it uh, shortly. But before that, I wanted to ask you want to um, to just talk about what when we see the teacher in um, a talk story or I see with the youngsters, what are the first things we would, uh, would see? What very clearly is different about what right. she's doing? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what to look for. What should be looking for when you watch this video? Now, let me say first, this video was shot probably in 1980 and it took seven or eight years for us to get to the point when you, where that was being done so smoothly and so capably by the teacher whose name was Ronnie, right at the time. I think she's since married and there's a different last name, but she was a fabulous teacher doing this. Okay, so what do we look for? First of all, if you haven't been in a classroom for a while, it's gonna look a little chaotic because the students, these five-year-olds are all talking at the same time. It seems like when you first see it. And what you notice is that the teacher, Ronnie, doesn't get rattled by this. And what she's doing is letting the students control the turn taking, no raising the hands, the students are just talking, but she very skillfully controls the topic. Right. Okay, so let's say we're not gonna see raising and we're not gonna see, and we're gonna see her being, uh, pulling a smooth uh, uh, stream of, of of repeating what the students say and, and keeping the, the steady stream of talk going and getting them to perform the activity and explain how they're doing it. Oh, your mom is it. strong. I'm sing it with me. I know. What else did I bring? Oh, peanut butter. butter. And and I brought and some jelly. jelly. What kind of jelly did I bring? Guava jelly. I like guava. Okay. All right, we're going to make our peanut butter sandwich. What is the first thing I'm going to need? Get the bread. I need to get the, a bread. piece of bread or a slice of bread. I'm what am I going to do with it? I'm going to make this. I'll put this first and put this second. Oh, yeah. Put it. Get the Where do I put it, James? No, get this like that. that. Put that on the bread. Put that jelly on the sandwich and then on the sandwich and then you eat. Put the, I put the that. jelly on top of the sandwich. No, like no, you open it. Then you put it on yes. the stuff. Oh, I need to twist the lid off the jar? Yeah, and make okay. like that. And put it on the... First, you have to do peanut butter. First, I no, have to do the that. peanut butter. I have to spread the peanut butter first? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, because I tried it. That's the like, that's, that's the way I have to do it. Okay. Everybody's looking. How do I spread it? Do I just take my finger and stick it in and rub it all over the no, bread? No, don't. 
think I just stick that in a... You stick the knife into the yeah. jar? Okay. And spread Okay, it's there. It's spread. Okay, what do I have to do? Just gotta mix them all. I have to spread yeah. it around on the top yeah. of the bread with the because knife? Because we saw you guys when we was in there. That was okay. All right, now I've spread my peanut butter all over my now bread. Now jelly. what do I do? Put jelly. the jelly. Put the jelly. Oh, I just pour it like no, this. No, I wash that and you put the jelly in. Oh, I put the knife into the jelly jar? No, you could be a mix up. Oh, I'm going to mix it up. So what do, how am I going to do it then? I only have one knife. Yeah, you got to wash it do? off. And ah, I have to wash it off. Yeah. Can I wash it off with just a napkin or yeah. can I wipe it off? Wipe it. wipe it off with the napkin so that I don't get my peanut butter mixed with my jelly. Now what do I do, James K? Put this in and spread it. I put the knife in and spread the jelly. Where? Do I spread it on the napkin? No. I spread it on the bread. Like that, like the peanut butter. I like it. Okay, now what do I do with it? You eat it. You do it like that. Oh. You, you I mean, I just flip it over? Yeah. The whole thing? Yeah. But the peanut butter and jelly is going to be all full. No, not like that. No, not like that? Not What am I doing if I do that? You get mixed up. What do you do with clothes? And eat it. What do you do with clothes? Juan, we have a question from the viewer, I think that leads us right into um, very good comments. Um, so her, the question is, wouldn't encouraging students to speak pidgin hinder their ability to flourish outside of Hawaii? Even if it's easy to understand to an uneducated people, pidgin presents itself as informal English rather than its own language. So what can you, um, can you say uh, comments on, on that question? Well, uh, our, our goal in this program, where the video came from, was to help the children acquire proficiency in standard English. And I'll give you some examples in that little clip that, that can be easy to miss. For example, at one point, the, uh, one of the students talks about uh, putting the peanut butter on the bread and he calls it rub it on the bread. In fact, several of the other children chime in and use rub as the verb, but the teacher uses the word, the verb spread it on the bread. And she repeats it. And if you look really closely in, into the lesson, one of those children starts to use that verb spread. Now, over the course of a year, what we discovered was, as long as the teacher always answered in standard English or asked questions in standard English or repeated in English and never criticized the students for using pidgin, by the end of the year, these students will have required a much wider range, not only of standard English vocabulary, spread instead of rub, or uh, many other examples. Not only do they do that, but they pick up standard English syntax, the order in which words are put together in a sentence, which is different than pidgin or creole. So in other words, in, in that program, we measured both growth in pidgin and growth in standard English, and we found both the students got more proficient in both dialects the standard dialect and the local dialect. In other words, they became bilingual or bi-dialectal. So the goal is if they leave Hawaii or they go somewhere in the islands where standard English is the lingua franca, where that's how people speak, they can do it. I'll give you an example, wonderful example. I was once asked to testify before a committee of the state uh, Senate of Hawaii and the chairman was speaking in standard English. And my testimony set off uh, a discussion among the senators on the committee. And after a while, they looked at each other and said, hey, hey guys, you know, let's just, let's just let's talk the way we 
to be more comfortable. And they all switch from perfect standard English to the most comfortable expressive form of local dialect, just switch back and forth. Just like people who are bilingual in Spanish and English can switch back and forth. So that was our goal is not to send everybody around the world speaking pidgin, but to help them be very comfortable and proficient in both dialects. That is very, um, just very good, Ron, and especially the examples. I mean, there was another one about wipe, wipe instead of some other word. Maybe they were using the rub again. But as far as the languages can see, you can see the language as you point out, and then you can, see, which is vocabulary development. But what it gives them is a more precise way of being able to speak about the task. And then they're also recognizing that there's a series, and she keeps reinforcing that in that you know there are a series of actions here to make this peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then they're learning about sequence and that first this and then that and no not that but this next and then even finding now there's some social differences and that some wouldn't put the jelly separately they would mix the jelly with the peanut butter first so anyway there's some of those interesting uh facts that you learn about the students and can be further topics of exploration uh uh that emanate from the activity. So the other thing is that they're, they're moving up the thinking ladder, right? So from just the doing of it and the recognizing of it, but then they're coming up and starting to see sequence and they're seeing, they're starting to get more analytic about how I want it done and how it's gonna do. And then towards the end of it, they can also start making judgments about whether it's a good sandwich or not as the way they made it. But I think that, um, with what Ron stated and then these other considerations and some that you and the audience may have too, there's a lot going on there. And um, I wanted to ask Ron what he thought about then the teacher's view of it from her perch running, running the activity, what's going on with her in that process, actually well, in her head. I mean, well, you know, one thing she has to be listening very, carefully and being a very good observer uh, and act listening, 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 looking for the opportunity to offer some instruction that's embedded in a conversation. I mean, the students think they're having a conversation, but the teacher has an instructional agenda. And one of the most prominent ones is, if you'll recall, at one point, she says, what do I do next? And a boy says, put the jelly on the bread. She takes the jar of jelly and sits it on the slice of bread. And they all say, no, 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 no. And she says, well, what do you want me to do? And she's deliberately trying to make them be more explicit and use explicit formal standard English forms, which is you take the knife, you put some jelly on the knife, and then you spread it on top of the peanut butter on the bread. She's trying to get them to speak in those kinds of formal sentences by acting out a silly thing, jar on the bread. And then, you know, you can, you can spend days telling people they need to be more explicit in their language. Here's a way, in a very clever way with five-year-olds, you, you make them want to be explicit because they don't want you to sit that jar on that bread because they want to get that sandwich made as fast as possible. So what's the best way to do that is explain to the teacher how you've got to get that jelly on top of that peanut butter so you can fold it over and we can eat it. <laughs> so that's all going on. You know, the teacher's head yes I mean and that's that self-talking and and moving herself through the process but I know Ron you've talked about how um and the studies show um and I this isn't recent recent research but uh likely it hasn't changed too much but that in the classroom the the teachers are speaking 90 percent of the time or, or some high percentage of the time and all of the kids together are speaking very low percentages of the time just because of some of the points that Ron has made you know, that they may be uncomfortable it's not a familiar uh language uh 
that they can use and they're afraid. And so they don't chime in. And uh, when an act activity like this with instructional conversation is engaged, you can see that nobody was uncomfortable. I mean, some of them to some degree were re more reticent, but without that kind of activity, they would even be uninterested. I mean, reticence a little different from un uninterested. So um, th those are um, the aspects of this, of this technique that, that give it so much usefulness. And I call it power because it gets you other places with these kids that you can go, that you can't go otherwise. It is. Now, just a little, you know, I just want to offer a sobering conclusion here, which is learning to do this as a teacher is more difficult than it looks. And, you know, it, 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 you know, it would be a mistake to think you can just show a teacher one video and say, okay, now you know how to do it. No, it takes, it takes, a, it takes work. And in general, what we found in later work when I moved to the mainland was it worked better when small groups of teachers in a grade level or a department in the high school could work on a problem of learning to do this and practice and help each other uh, perfect it. Because it's not easy. Even if you're teaching in college, it's so easy to fall into the teacher talking most of the time. And believe me, I know because I taught university 50 years and I always talk too much. Well, um, that is interesting. I mean, do you think that, uh, that, do you think that's one of the hardest things that a teacher has to learn to do is, is to be able to ask the, well, come up with the activity that's compelling and that solves some of the problem, but then, yes. um, and certainly, uh, and then how to ask the questions, Ron, how, how do you do that? How do you think that through? It's very difficult, you know, learning how to listen carefully pick up on what students are saying, know which student's utterance you want to pick up and follow. It takes practice and time. Like anything, it, it takes practice. And it's not something you could quickly learn to do well. I certainly uh, appreciate your saying that because all of, all of this work, um, when it's done well, looks like the ice skating gold medal award. And then you go out and try and do it yourself and you find out what you have to do. To Ronnie Wright made it look easy, but it's not, and it's, not. I, I, it's worth the effort. If anybody thinks uh, thinks they'd like to try it, it is worth yeah. the effort. Because in the long run, it do, it does benefit the students. Zach, so okay, well we're we're running into aloha time, so we're running out of it is what we're doing, and we'll have to wrap up. So. Um, Thank you, Ron. I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton. This is the state of the state of Hawaii on the Think Tech live streaming network series. And we've been talking remotely with Dr. Ronald Gallimore about talk story in instructional conversation. And I'll see you in two weeks on the next state of the state of Hawaii. Mahalo for your attention, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs>